should you be worrying about gaming addiction? The worse things got with my family, the more I went into that online world of gaming and it's consumed my life and to the point where I lost my job and I lost my family, um, my home, my job, everything. One of the largest addiction treatment firms in this country has told this programme that although the figures are still small, the number of people they've seen for gaming has tripled in the last four years. We'll talk to an addiction therapist. What's his advice for making sure people don't become addicted to screens? And there's regularly a moral panic about children and young people getting addicted to gaming and this program has learned that there are a growing number of people seeking private treatment because they're alarmed about being hooked on gaming but interestingly the figures are small one of the largest addiction treatment firms in the uk has told us that the number of people they've seen for this has tripled in the last four years going from seven people to 22 hardly an epidemic it's a trend though that other private therapists and providers are also seeing the World Health Organization has classified gaming disorder as a mental health condition for the first time. And the first NHS clinic to treat gaming addiction is soon to open. Here's Divya Tawa. If you see a story about video gaming in the news, it's often negative. The bikers are meant to be over by the farm on the right. The World Health Organization now recognizes gaming disorder as a mental health condition. My gaming was pretty much all day, every day. While for most, gaming is just harmless fun, for some, it can spiral into a problem with major consequences. Depression, anxiety, loss of relationships, one of the largest private addiction treatment firms has told this programme the number of people they've seen for video gaming has tripled in the last four years. If I wasn't gaming, I was thinking about gaming. It just consumed me. Here on Harley Street in central London, a number of clinics offer private help for video gaming problems. This is Liliana. We're not using her real name. She's come to see an addiction expert based here. Whatever it is, you wouldn't be doing that consistently if it wasn't giving you something that actually you need emotionally, OK? Now, I've been allowed to sit in on Liliana's session. She's 18 and started playing online video games on her phone about six months ago. Most days I'll just get home and I'll, I'll feel tired after work and I just decide to play on my phone instead of doing whatever it is I need to do and I just say I'll do it tomorrow, I'll do it in a few hours or something. So use it when you're bored, use it when you're stressed, you're using it as an antidote to a lack of challenge perhaps. Do you ever use it late at night for example? Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll use it until like early morning sometimes. What consequences have already taken place as a direct result of you playing this this game? I feel like socially and like in my work it's affecting me. I'll be really tired from staying up late. Right. I'll be in a really bad mood and I won't be able to concentrate. Liliana works in a coffee shop. She tells Adam playing games on her phone is taking over her life. She's isolating herself from friends and family, staying in her bedroom to play games. Now, other than relaxation, what else do you feel you get back positively from um, the games that you play? I'd say, like, challenge. Mm hmm Because um, I feel good once I've completed, a, like, a certain song. Yeah. So the key thing is, you need, at some level, elements of challenge and relaxation, and there might be other needs as well and you're not currently getting that from how you primarily spend your time. By the end of the 45-minute session, Liliana takes an important step. And it may be that the best thing you can do is to delete those games. Are you willing to delete those games? Yeah. OK. Can you do that now? OK. You can always make that decision to reinstall them, even if you lose things like high scores and levels and things like that. But what it would mean is that that becomes a decision that you're making to choose fabricated experiences rather than real experiences. Liliana will see Adam again in three weeks. We catch up after today's session. 
So you've taken a, a really big step today and deleted all the games from your phone. Do you think that you, you can keep it up? I hope that I can, yeah. I really want to try. Now it's time to fight back. There isn't specialised treatment for gaming disorder on the NHS, but that's about to change with plans to open the first internet addiction clinic in London. We found people are increasingly turning to the private sector for help. It's a trend seen by UCAT, one of the largest providers of addiction treatment across the country. They run several private rehab centres like Primrose Lodge here in Guildford, which treats all kinds of addictions. UCAT's clinics have seen more people getting help for gaming addiction. This man, who we're calling Sean, was one of them. It was an escapism from me, and if I wasn't gaming, I was thinking about gaming. What impact has gaming had on your life? Uh, the absolute worst. My gaming was pretty much all day, every day. My children were like an inconvenience because they wanted my time and I wasn't able to give them my time or my love. You know, I remember shouting at my partner, telling my children to go away. The dog used to come and sit next to me because I never used to take the dog out and I would literally swear at the dog. Eventually, things got so bad, Sean checked into rehab, spending a month in treatment. The worse things got with my family, the more I went into that online world of gaming and it's consumed my life and to the point where I lost my job and I lost my family, uh, my home, my job, everything. Spending hours playing video games isn't a sign of a problem. It's when it gets in the way of your life with negative consequences. There isn't enough research to know how big a problem video game addiction is, but most experts would put it at less than a few percent of all players. While the majority of people coming to private treatment centres like this are for alcohol, drug and gambling problems, there is a real and growing number seeking help for video gaming. In four years, UCAT has seen more than a 200% increase in people across their centres. Why do you think you've seen this increase? So there's some good research, research out there to show that games are designed to engage people in such a way that to create an addictive process is more likely. Um, secondly is um, accessibility to games, so moving from just from consoles to you know, uh, tablets and, and mobile phones. Um, and lastly, it's more in the public conscious now. And it's not just a trend seen by UCAT. Several other private therapists and treatment providers have also told us they are seeing more cases. Like this place on Harley Street we came to three weeks ago. So the last time we were here, we met Liliana. She was a young girl who came to get help with her gaming problem. Well, she's got another session today and I want to know if she's managed to stay away from those video games. Her therapist, Adam Cox, has been seeing more cases like Liliana, typically several each month. A few years ago, he hardly saw any. What's been different, have you found? It's been really weird because every time that I've like, thought about it or I could have um, played games, I just the feeling was really different. I wasn't enthusiastic about it mm. as much anymore and then I just felt like happier when I felt, realised how I was feeling. Liliana hasn't played any games in three weeks. She's been tempted, but she's been practicing some of the techniques she's learned, like thinking about what real experiences she's missing out on. Do you think you'll be able to keep up, you know, staying off the games? Uh, I think, yeah, it looks like, like it. I just think there's better things that I could be doing. You're smiling now. Yeah. <laughs> so you're clearly, clearly happier than you were when we met you three weeks ago. Mm, yeah, I was really embarrassed and really ashamed. But yeah, I'm really happy now that I'm, I've changed my, my, the way I'm seeing it. Sean relapsed after leaving rehab a few times, but he's back on track the last 14 months. He's hoping with gaming disorder now recognised as a clinical condition, it will legitimise a problem he struggled with for many years and open the door for more treatment options. Do you think you can ever pick up a game and just play without it turning into a problem? No. It's like an alcoholic can never go back and drink normally again, and I can never do that again. I'm pretty sure of that. It's not like I think to myself, right, I'm going to go home today and mess up. All I can do is make plans for the future. It's good to make plans and have dreams and hopes, but 
live in the moment and learn to just live for right now. And right now, everything's okay. Let's speak to the therapist and addiction expert, Adam Cox, who you saw in that film. Good morning to you. Morning. Now, for our audience who might not necessarily be worried about people becoming addicted to gaming, but definitely worried about their kids being on screens for too long, what's your advice? I think for, <coughs> for, for parents, really, it's to set boundaries. Um, games are designed to be very addictive because the gaming companies want people to spend more time and in fact more money through microtransactions on the game. So the first thing parents can do is to set boundaries, let them have a certain window of time that they can actually play the games and say that they can only play the games if they do certain key things like finish homework and get good grades in school, things like that. Right. And what about that moment, maybe it's 7pm in the evening, uh, where you say, right, time's up, you've had your time on the screen and they say, I'm in the middle of a game, I can't stop now and it leads to friction and worse. I think the reason for that is that the game formats have changed and it used to be that games didn't involve other people whereas these battle royale kind of formats you're playing against other people and if you've invested a lot of time and you're still playing that game that represents success so for a parent to say right you've got to stop now undoes everything they've done up to that point mm -hmm. so my advice to parents would be allow them to choose certain games that enable them just to pause or stop without any consequences and maybe those other formats of games maybe play at weekends and other times the numbers addicted to gaming seeking treatment privately are small. Do we really need to worry about gaming addiction? I think the nature of the, the model of how these gaming companies make money has changed from selling games, people playing those games, to now a lot of the time the games are free and they make money inside the, the actual gaming experience. And I think we're at the tip of the iceberg. I think over the next few years we can expect more cases like we saw with this nine-year-old of, of you know weeing herself rather than actually leaving the game. We're going to see more cases like this and more cases of people spending thousands upon thousands of pounds in, uh, in games um, and they can't simply stop. Thank you very much, Adam. You're Thanks welcome. for coming on the programme. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for your company. BBC Newsroom Live is next.